Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the February 1st, 2018 regular meeting of the Harbor Advisory Board. Uh, as you can see, Mr. Reisner will not be present tonight, um, but he will be back next month. We do have a quorum of five out of seven, so the meeting can commence. We could start with a, a moment of silence. Thank you. And Dana, would you lead us in the pledge? Ready? Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll now go on to uh, announcements from advisory board members and our liaison, Jean. Uh, let's see. Um, we had some really extreme tides this last week, and it appears as though the across from the Tidelands dock there, the mudflats have shoaled toward the east a little bit. There are several boats that are minus tides that are on the bottom at the minus tides there with the east coming wind. So those boats are after to be moved over towards the east, and it's going to make it that area just a little bit more congested. And then also um, on February 17th and 18th, we have the Big Bad and Ugly Surf Contest coming up. So it's a little far out to tell what the surf's going to be like, but uh, it's always fun. So that's it. Thank you. Jeremiah? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, from the, uh, from the fishermen's end of the table here I want to remind everybody that on Saturday the ladies organization will be doing uh, uh, their tuna enchiladas uh, albacore tuna enchiladas green or red ones they're ten dollars per tray uh, and that will be at the community center between 1 and 5 p.m. on Saturday and I encourage if anybody hasn't had them they should give them a try they're terrific uh, also, the Fishermen's Commercial Fishermen's Organization here in Morro Bay is having a membership meeting on February 11th, and that's going to be at the Vets Hall here between 12 noon and 3 o'clock. And I would encourage anybody, uh, whether they are a member of the organization or not, to attend. Uh, there's going to be a discussion on the wind energy. Uh, situation here in the area and also a discussion about the package that the Morro Bay Commercial Fishermen's Organization is going to submit to Trident Wind Energy. It's a mitigation package so I think it would be a good idea to have everybody there uh, to discuss the which package actually uh, that we'll be bringing to the table to Trident en uh, Wind Energy. Also, Joan Solo is going to uh, give a, a little talk on the Morro Bay Historic Society, and that will be at that meeting also. Uh, and right after her talk, there will be an economist from Cal Poly who is uh, likely going to tell us what they think about mitigation and the commercial fishing industry with the wind energy plant proposed for our county here. So anyways, that's uh, that's all we've got to say. Thank you. Uh, two questions, Jeremiah. One, could you repeat the date for your meeting? Uh, <clears throat> sure. That membership meeting is February 11th, and that will be between 12 noon and 3 o'clock. Lunch will be served. Mark uh, Togginsini's restaurant will be... Uh, Doing, doing a lunch in there. Uh, I'll, I'll also, I would like to mention that uh, this, uh, at currently the wind energy project for this area, is somewhat 
up in the air. They're waiting for uh, disposition of the Department of Defense to see if, in fact, it will be compatible with uh, the Department of Defense's need for the waters out in front of this area. Hey, Jeremiah, um, you have to order early for this Albert Court thing, Becca said, so you need to call these two numbers. Oh, thank you. I didn't. Oh, really? I didn't realize that. Thank you. Uh, so, Bill just said that uh, the Albuquerque orders have to be in early. I guess the pickup, the time I indicated between one and five was the pickup time. Correct. Please call Jackie Nungry for orders at 772-8281 or Lenore. Ward at five five zero zero two five three. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. And the location for the fishermen's organization meeting? The applications will be uh, at the meeting. No, the lo location. Lo oh, the location here in uh, the vet's hall. The vet's hall. The vet's hall. Yeah, okay. I think I mentioned. It. Just for people in TV land. Okay. Yeah, it is here at the vet's hall at, uh, between. The fishermen's organization meeting between 12 and 3. Dana. Yes, uh, announcement of two sailing events coming up. A collegiate event, uh, Cal Poly. We'll be putting on the Mustang Regatta again this year in March, the first weekend. And uh, that's a two day event. We usually get about 10 different colleges that show up and some of them have multiple boats, multiple teams. And Cal Poly has been doing a fantastic job. They're student-run club, and they were just last weekend were down at PCC's, and, which is Pacific Coast Championships, uh, for team racing down in Santa Barbara last weekend, and they got second. So that was fantastic. They beat out the uh, Cal Maritime keel haulers, which was a big, big win for them. So they're moving up, and uh, the weekend after that, we'll have the Big Rock Regatta. I think I saw it on the staff report there, uh, and that's always uh, fun. That'll be our 12th annual. That's the entry-level kids in the little bathtubs, so you'll see a lot of them out on that weekend. So come out and watch it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, now, Bill. Um, as you can see up here on the screen, I put... Uh, the Friends of the Morro Bay Harbor Department was asked by the Harbor Office, uh, Becca Kelly, to raise money to replace the um, Sea Lion Dock. So if anyone saw the um, article in the Telegraph Tribune last Wednesday, we had a great article about what we're attempting to do is replace the, um, the dock completely. It's, 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 it's been out there for 30 plus years. And um, so we're looking for funds. As of today, we've already raised approximately $8,000 in one week. So we're needing a little bit more money. Uh, you can go to www.friendsofthemorbayharbordepartment.org and donate. If you give $1,000, we're going to put your name on a plaque out there. We've already, <laughs> we already have seven individuals that have given a thousand dollars so it's amazing um, and I thank every one of them uh, for donating to this worthy cause so um, the Harbor Department is very grateful they will not have to use I don't think any of their existing funds to replace this Jeremiah um, is the head of um, this project if you have any questions or um, you can talk to Becca Kelly too so thank you. Uh, could could yes. you clarify that? I'm the head of the project. No, no, no. Jeremiah, the uh, Harbor Patrol officer. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just want a clarification. Yeah, I apologize. Okay. What is Jeremiah's last name? Eric? Jacobs. 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 Jeremiah Jacobs is head of the project. Okay. Not O'Brien. Okay. Yes, Gene. Um, is it possible to put those plaques maybe on a location that's that's not underneath the seal, the sea lion? <laughs> maybe on like the fishing piers or something rather? Right well, um, I mean they're just going to get destroyed. Yeah, there. and that's and possible. you're absolutely right. We need to. That's something that we really do need to figure out. And um, 
uh, anywhere along the Harbor Walk would be yeah. just fine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, thank you, everyone in TV land. <laughs> thank you, Bill. Uh, Matt, do we hear anything from you? I don't have anything. Okay. Uh, so, next we'll go on to public comment. If there's anybody in the audience who would like to address or talk about a subject that is either on the agenda and they can't wait for it or that is not on our agenda, can come forward now. Seeing none, public comment is closed. Uh, there is nothing on the consent calendar, so we'll go to reports and appearances. We could have Mr. Endersby and the staff report, uh, status report. Sure, thank you, um, and happy February. Good to see everybody again. So our usual statistics, um, rundown from the Harbor Patrol, um, been relatively quiet, knock on wood, although a little bit of mayhem out there. Um, two emergency responses over about the last month, 132 calls for service, 25 assists, um, about 21 enforcement contacts, and 15 weather warnings. Um, a lot of that was for um, hazardous bar type, large surf things. Um, small craft advisories, um, and then six hazardous bar postings. So as you know, I think, I think that last week, the week before last, we had a pretty big swell. Um, we had, in fact, the next item on the agenda, our next item, paragraph up, um, we had about six, seven, probably even eight days once it um, died out of large surf and hazardous bar warnings, um, combined with our typical winter negative tides in the afternoon. Um, as you know, the, the surf spot inside the North Jetty, Widow Walls, has become very popular, but with that comes a danger with those outgoing negative tides because that's when it breaks is when the tide's really low. So um, people need to be aware, especially when their kids are surfing there, that there's a, somewhat of a fine line between where you can safely surf up against the jetty in the shallows there and you get over into the channel pretty quickly and zoom, you're out to the harbor entrance in a heartbeat. So people need to be aware of that. Um, on the 18th, the largest day of the swell, we had a fog come in in the afternoon. It was a beautiful day and the fog just came in out of nowhere, kind of like a spring day. And then we shortly thereafter we had an emergency call for a surfer down at Montana de Oro and us in the Coast Guard and we said, we're not going. The thick fog, too big in the harbor entrance. Uh, there was no way to safely navigate out and even the Coast Guard and the motor lifeboat said they're not going to go out because it was just unsafe. Fortunately, there is a um, off-duty lifeguard down there at Montana de Oro that was able to help affect the rescue of the person and everything turned out okay. But to let you know, it's you know we're out there and we're well equipped us in the Coast Guard to do a lot of things, but uh, can't go everywhere all the time sometimes. So you need to be aware. Uh, we've stepped up enforcement with a new year on registration on boats. So just to remind everybody, um, hopefully everybody registers their boats annually. That's obviously required by law, like your car. Uh, a lot of people don't put their new stickers on until maybe they go out to their boat the first time. So just make sure you got your sticker out there, even. Even though you're legally registered, just like your car, you got to have the new year plate on there as well. So make sure you got your new stickers on there, um, and everything's current and kept on board. And again, um, the floating dock out there for the sea lines, um, great project. Been working with the Marine Mammal Center to make sure that um, have a discussion with Bill or to make sure that when we do the changeover from the old dock to the new, that the sea lines don't disappear with the old dock. So we'll have to figure out a strategy to make sure that they stay put because uh, we certainly don't want to chase them away. Um, so that's pretty much it on the patrol front. Um, dredging wise, I wanted to bring up uh, the perpetual uh, Morro Bay dredging. It's about a year old now. Um, they finished the dredging months ago, but they had some pipe stuck over on the sand spit. Atna went over there last week on those really negative low tides. They had about 200 feet stuck over there from last October. Um, that washed up on the sand spit, the pipeline they had running outside the harbor. They lost several thousand feet. They recovered all but about 200 feet of it. Um, but it was when they first tried to take it out back in, I want to say maybe early December or late November, it was too buried. Um, it was because when it got washed loose, it was in the middle of winter with some big swell, so a lot of sand was missing and the summer sand filled back in. So it was buried deep. They couldn't get it. Fortunately, we've had a couple of swells that have eaten some of the sand away, and then they had the super negative low tides last week, and they got about 75 feet of it out. There's still about 125 feet they cannot get. Um, so they're going to own it until it shows back up. Um, so we'll see if it does or if it's just buried out there forever. We just don't know. 
pretty heavily dug in. There's just really no practical good way to get it, unfortunately. So there it is, uh, the perpetual dredging project that still isn't over. So we'll see what happens. Um, recent council activity. Um, council declared um, January is Morbay Winter Bird Festival month. As you know, the bird festival has been ever popular and growing over the years uh, as it continues to do so. Also on January 9th, Council gave authorization for a contingent of folks to go to Washington, D.C. on our usual CMANC, the California Marine Affairs and Navigation Conference trip, to lobby mainly for Corps of Engineers dredging. Um, this year's delegation has grown considerably. Um, years past, it was typically the, the mayor and the harbor director. Um, and then for a few years, we had mayor, harbor director, and city manager. Um, now with the wastewater treatment plant, the water reclamation facility project, um, continuing along and seeking funding and from Washington, um, federal funding for that. Um, we're also sending out an ex uh, additional council person, John Heading is going, and uh, Rob Livick, the um, public works director. Um, obviously, they're not going on the harbor's dime, that's, they're going on the general fund's dime, um, but we're doing the usual mayor and harbor director with uh, hopefully a grant from cable committee, although the cable committee hasn't um, announced their grant cycle yet, but we're hoping to be able to get funding for that and then um, those three will be going as well, and I think um, John Heading is going to be kind of bouncing between, um, Councilman Heading be bouncing between core things and, and um, those types of things in the wastewater treatment plant, our water reclamation facility project. So um, going to be a few more people to shepherd around this year, so we'll see how that goes. And finally, on the 9th, uh, City Council passed the uh, resolution Keep America's Waterfronts Working Act that we brought in front of the Harbor Advisory Board, I think, last month as well. And so they passed that. They agreed that was a good act to, uh, good act to follow, I guess, um, a good act to support. And we'll be sending that support on to the congressional um, sponsor of that bill. And then on the 23rd, um, the Council approved a conditional use permit for the Gray's Inn to do a modest um, remodel of that site. Um, as you may or may not know, um, Josephine Gray sold that site about two years ago to a young couple from Southern California who came up and um, continued to operate um, mainly the hotel, but the, the gallery is there as well. And to get a new lease, it, this lease, the current lease expires 2018, the, uh, to get a new longer term lease, they're going to do some remodeling on the interior, do some ADA upgrades, they're going to put in the Harbor Walk access along the backside, along the water side, and including new lateral access from the street. Um, so that'll be coming forward as well for approval sometime in the future for a new lease. But um, they're off to coastal condition or coastal um, commission now to go get their coastal permits, and then once they get coastal, and as long as nothing changes drastically, you should see that get under construction. Um, don't know if they'll get to it this winter or not. Um, I don't know they'd want to get under construction in the middle of summer, but um, don't really have a, a plan yet for them. But those will be coming as well. <clears throat> they also had some ADA parking um, improvements there as well. Um, fishing wise, I think Jeremiah have, um, brought up a couple things there. Dungeness crab, I think, continues to go kind of slow. A um, few guys are picking away at it out front. I haven't heard a lot from up north. Um, doesn't sound like it's a boomtown type season, but still, hopefully, a little early. It, it's been slow up the coast. The, uh, the Oregon had, uh, they just opened about probably a week and a half ago. And uh, their initial pull wasn't too bad, but since then it's been uh, it's slowed down quite a bit. So it's, uh, the the class size uh, of the crab they're catching uh, is right in the middle of the El Ninos that we had, so it's not totally unexpected. And uh, there was a delay. A delay that cost them uh, quite a bit too. The crabs are moved around now, and they're not uh, as plentiful inshore as they would have been had they got to them earlier in the season here. Okay, thanks for that. So other than that, you know, a little bit of black cod action, and you know, some still a little bit of live fish, but pretty slow. Uh, upcoming events, quite a long list. Um, February 17th and 18th, as Gene said, the big bad and ugly surf contest, um, shaping up to be a great event like it usually is. I haven't quite seen the surf forecast out that far. It's a little far to know, but I don't think there's anything over the Richter scale top coming, but we'll see what happens. You never know. Uh, March 16th, the Leprechaun Crawl, uh, new event, kind of similar to the Santa Crawl that we put on, the city put on here. 
back over around the holidays, um, this one being sponsored by the Friends of the Harbor Department. Um, friends seem to be becoming the home for many of these events, which is great. Um, Dana brought up the, the Big Rock Regatta. Um, April 6th through 8th is the 15th annual Morbay Citywide Yard Sale. That's always been a huge event. It's, I think, even spilling over into Los Osos and Caicos now. Everybody jumps on board on that one, so that's a huge event. So if you're looking to get rid of things or get things, there's a good time to do go find some treasures. Um, April 15th, Morbay Yacht Club opening day. Um, getting out kind of far here, but that's fine. People can plan ahead. April 21, Family, ne family Care Network. Um, 15th annual Miracle Mall for Kids run, fun run. That's from Moral Rock all the way over to Cayucas Pier. Super popular event, great fundraiser um, for the Family Care Network. Uh, I think they upwards of several thousands of people participate in that now. Um, Kite Festival, um, April 28th, also Friends of the Harbor Department. Um, on board with that one. May 5th or May 3rd to the 6th, Cruise and Morbay Car Show. That show has grown, if anybody has seen it. Um, it Pretty much takes all of Morbay Boulevard and goes across Main Street and on down towards the water, towards uh, Dorns, toward the end of Morbay, or Morbay Boulevard. So that show's gotten bigger and better every year as well. Uh, May 19th to 25th, National Safe Boating Week, uh, where Coast Guard and Harbor Departments like us are out there promoting boating safety and um, getting out on the water and letting folks know what's out there to do and what's going on. Um, May 26th, 28th, that's Memorial Day, Art in the Park, um, and kind of kick off of our summer lifeguard season um, for having lifeguards full-time in the tower. And July, man, we're getting way out there. July 14th is the 49th annual Brian Waterbury Rock to Pier Run um, and Half Marathon. So that event is the city's um, signature run event from Morro Bay to Caicos, and that's gotten huge as well. So a bunch of great events coming up. Um, Tis the season. On the pending HAB recommendations page, again, new stuff for this meeting I've put in red. Um, and I try to date everything so I keep kind of a flow going. So there's really nothing on that first page. Um, bleeding off of number two, which was um, staff provide council's modified sections of Morbay Municipal Code 1524 regarding environmental BMPs. That's on your agenda tonight. So that's one of the rules and regulation sections or chunks that we were knocking off over the last couple of years. So these are the final versions coming to you tonight um, for approval and then we'll bake those and get those to the council eventually once we get them all done. Um, item number four, um, issuance of a marine service facility boatyard RFP document um, for financial services, financial feasibility services. That's on your agenda, a little review of that as well tonight. So I don't go need to go too much into that. So that one's got a little activity. On the next page, item six, um, city use consultant to update the cost allocation plan. As we know, that's also one of the city's, or the council's goals um, with, on the Harbor Advisory Board work plan, or uh, yeah, the Harbor Advisory Board goal work plan. Um, currently engaging in internal gut check on that. Um, one of my officers, Scott Mathers, the, the lighting being one of the big ticket items, um, we've mapped out all of the lights on the waterfront and confirming it's actually about half a dozen that he can't find that pg e appears to be charging us for. So we're not only going to square that up, and then there's some lights that say they're one type, and then they're not. They're another, and pg e charges those lights by the size and type. So there may be some mischarged lights on there. And then just trying to um, figure out which ones are in the Tidelands and which ones are not, and then we'll go up to finance and um, probably incorporate that into the next year's um, cost allocation costs as we move forward. Um, so that's kind of our what's going on with our gut check on the, on the cost allocation. And item number eight, um, the eelgrass um, language in the general plan, local coastal plan. We've executed the contract, and I, that's in my eelgrass um, ad hoc committee report as well, with Anchor QEA to begin helping us plot forward a path to potential um, regulatory bliss to get ourselves some regulatory relief on eelgrass mitigation and eelgrass management. So um, we'll be getting um, a schedule from Anchor and get with Lynn, the chair of that committee, and NEP and the other folks on that committee and start getting meetings together and, and figure out where we're going to go with that. And that looks like all of them. Any questions? Thank you. Yes, Bill. 
did you get a call back from the state regarding your meeting that you are hopefully going to have next week for the Back Bay Marina? No. Nope. Laura? No? No. Nope. Are you going to follow through on that? Yep. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Dana, did you have a question? No. Jeremiah. Uh, just out of curiosity, Eric, does, uh, does uh, the harbor expect a rebate from PG&E on the electrical bill? We could always ask. <laughs> it, it, I guess it'll depend on where it all... Once we get our final findings on it, we'll be going to PG&E. I guess we'll, we'll find the commercial service representative and probably do a show and tell, a field trip and walk and talk and point these things out and, and see where they take it. I don't know what their policy is or how that works, but I would certainly uh, look in that direction. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks. Dean? Is there somewhere on the agenda where we're approving minutes? There are no minutes. There are no minutes. No. From last month? No. That's just, just, my, like, just my question. No, we just don't have them done yet. Just no, didn't get them. <laughs> Maybe next month we'll see them. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Eric, on these lights, is it PG&E that changes the type and the location, or is it the city or the harbor department, or who would have made these changes and not had them noted? I don't know how much interaction PG&E does with a typical city when it comes to lighting or where, why they put a light there and not there and how that works or if the city requests something or how that whole thing works. Um, there, I would hope there's somebody up in, in City Hall or public services that sort of manages that list and reviews it periodically for billing purposes because we get a, a invoice from PG&E. I don't know if they bill us monthly, they just bill us once per year. Um, but we get a pretty hefty bill. You know, it's darn near $100,000 per year. So uh, I hope somebody's keeping an eye on it. Uh, but when it comes to PG&E changing something out, like for example, there was a couple of lights that that showed on the list as 30 to 40 foot poles with the two arms hanging out with the, the larger sodium type lights up pretty high and they were actually just those black metal poles with what's called the coach lights, kind of like the little porch light on the top. Uh -huh. So obviously probably a lot lower power usage on the, the metal pole single one than the big outstretched arm one. Um, but how the process goes if PG&E wants to change something out from one to the other, I don't know how that works. I know they changed all the lights out at the Rock here a few years ago. Is there a meter somewhere? No, they don't meter them. They're trying, PG&E, my understanding is they want to get out of the business of owning all these lights and charging cities. They just want to meter, the city owns them and meters and gets metered for it. Um, they don't want to own them and deal with them. Um, they've, PG&E, I'm assuming through the Public Utilities Commission, and they have enough, you know, for a, for a 3,000 lot watt sodium, you know, such and such bulb, PUC probably says you can charge the customer this for it. And so it's just a, a per light bulb type thing, and so that's where it comes from. But just we need to make sure that the right lights are there and that there actually are there. So there's two parts of this. So hopefully it'll give us some monetary relief both from the city end um, in terms of the cost allocation and what we were being charged and PG&E with things that may not be there anymore or change to something lower cost. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, next on our agenda is the Community Quota Fund. Uh, Mr. Oberhoff, if you'll come to the podium. I have a presentation. Yes. Um, AGP. AGP. Yeah, he's coming.
Do the same thing. Thanks. Good evening, board. Um, my name is Dwayne Oberhoff. I'm the executive director of the Morro Bay Community Quota Fund, and I'm here for <clears throat> our annual update to your board. Um, we hope to make it an annual event um, to come to this board to give you guys an update. I believe the last time we were here was in April of last year. So, um, just a couple quick things before we jump into the quota fund. I just wanted to present on where Morro Bay is kind of standing um, right now with, uh, with regards to uh, both landings of pounds of fish and value. This is total landings for Morro Bay, everything um, from 2007 to 2016. And um, you'll notice there's like a little bit of a dip in 2014 um, into 2015 and 16, and um, mainly due to the variable variability in squid landings. So I kind of took that out, I took squid out. Um, since it is so variable, just to show you that the landings have actually been pretty stable, <clears throat> excuse me, since um, about 2009. Um, actually, 2006, I only had data up to 2016 because they're usually um, a year off. Um, but you'll see that the landings in 2016 were the highest uh, since 2012. Um, the interesting thing that you can see there is that um, the value has actually kind of stabilized in 2011. Um, and. Um, I'm not sure where it is right now, about a little bit over $6 million worth of landings, not counting squid, in 2016. So um, that's pretty good. Uh, the interesting thing, I, I did some math here before I come out, came over here, and since 2007, there's been a 600% uh, percent increase in landings um, and, and over a 400% percent increase in the value of landings since 2007. So, Excuse me, Dwayne, what is the red line? I can't read that. Red line is value, dollars. And all of these data here come from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife website. So, well, All right, so jumping into the Morro Bay Community Quota Funds update. Um, we do have a new trawler in town. Um, he arrived, I believe, last July. Um, it's interesting. He, he is a young guy. He might be the youngest trawler on the West Coast. He's, I think, like 28 or 29. His name's Kyle Pemberton. Um, he, boat the, I'm sorry, he bought the Mariah Lee here, um, this boat from a fisherman in Half Moon Bay, brought it down here. Um, it's interesting, he, he recognized the opportunity down in Morro Bay, was willing to work with the quota fund, purchased the boat, and is, is trawling. It's, 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 pretty, it's pretty awesome. Um, like I said, he's working with the quota fund on both the permit that he um, uses to fish and his leasing quota from the quota fund. Um, he is a member of the California Groundfish Collective, which is the, um, the risk pool for overfish species. Um, and he, um, on a side note, since the fishery has 100% account accountability where you have to have an observer on board every time you make a trip, um, he actually is part of a project testing electronic monitoring. So you can't really tell in this photo, but he's got a bunch of cameras on his boat that face in different directions. Um, so he doesn't carry a human observer. So um, hopefully the um, results of that of, of the testing of that equipment will result in um, some favorable outcomes for the fishermen, you know, um, hopefully cheaper monitoring cost. Another update is that the annual quota funds, there's four of them now in California. Uh, I'm sorry, not annual, sorry. The quota funds in California came together and had their annual meeting last week, I think it was, in January 23rd and 24th. Um, that, um, the quota funds came from um, Fort Bragg, um, Half Moon Bay, Monterey Bay, and us in Morro Bay. We had, I believe, four directors from Morro Bay at the meeting. We, had, we held it at the, uh, the inn at Morro Bay, which was a really, actually, really nice location. Um, the other quota funds had representatives from their communities here also. Uh, we discussed, we were there for a day and a half, so we discussed a lot of different um, things, but um, some of the bigger topics we discussed was, you know, do we share a common vision amongst all the quota funds? And, and we do. Um, we also discussed what are some of the common challenges that each of the quota funds face, and then also talked about what is, what, what's been successful in each of the communities, what's been working. Um, it was a good gathering, and um, I believe the previous if, uh, annual uh, meeting was in August of 2016, and hopefully we can do it again um, next year. So the Morro Bay Community Quota Fund received a grant to implement a loss gear recovery program, and the purpose of this um, of this um, program and, and receiving these funds is to address unintentional um, entanglement of wells. 
which is a huge priority for the Dungeness crab fishery. Um, the goal of the program is to recover lost um, crab traps from the water and then explore possibilities for a long-term, cost-effective, and industry-managed uh, program. And the program um, ultimately will be working with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and um, informing um, implementation of a state bill, the Lost Gear Recovery Bill. And to date, and I don't know how far back this goes, I think it might be 2016, um, more than a, a little bit more than a thousand um, Dungeness crab traps have been recovered. Um, so the goal here in Morro Bay is to take the grant funds that we have, engage um, um, two to three, maybe four local uh, Dungeness crab fishermen um, to see if they'd like to participate on the recovery team to go out and um, locate and or recover um, lost gear, which will usually start in July and go through October after, after crab season is finished. Another update is um, the grants that we, we give out at the Quota Fund. Um, we have a collaborative, collaborative fisheries research fund. Um, one of the objectives of the Quota Fund is to advance scientific knowledge of uh, economically and environmentally sustainable fishing practices and marine health. So the fund um, was established to um, enhance collaborative fisheries research on the Central Coast. And um, there's a provision that a portion of our um, revenue will be awarded to to the program. Um, in 2015, 16 thousand dollars were awarded to two different um, grants. So it's anticipated in 2018 that we'll be looking at distributing funds um, and flying a request for proposals, which will then, um, when the proposals come in, they'll go to the um, quota funds science advisory committee, who will review them. Um, and then make recommendations to the board for um, award and distribution of grant funds. There is also an opportunity um, with the um, Morro Bay Community Quota Fund to um, participate in the West Coast IFQ crownfish trawl fishery. Uh, we have permits and quota available and um, this flyer that you see here will be um, sent around probably put one in the harbor office um, posted maybe at a couple different locations on the docks where fishermen can see them um, to maybe um, see if anybody's interested in um, maybe leasing quota or permit from the quota fund or if they have questions about it um, to see if it's something that would work for them so that's that's all i have for an update unless the board has any questions um, and this is kyle our new trawl fisherman at the end here. Questions from board members? Right. Um, I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jim. Oh, oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, I was just wondering when we expect the trawler to be back in business. Is there any word on? Um, I talked to him the other day. Um, he said soon. Um, sometimes soon for fishermen means different than somebody else I've learned so I don't know I think that um, based on the crab season down there or up there and down here I got a feeling it's 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 probably gonna be sooner than usual I have a feeling it'll probably be sometime in um, early to mid-march okay thanks yeah. Dwayne thanks for the present yeah uh, I do have a question about the observers versus the cameras that they're using on the one trawler mm -hmm. uh, I understand that having paying an observer to go out on your fishing trips is very, very costly. It's about 500 or more a day. That's pretty costly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so with the cameras, you just, you're, the fisherman is buying the cameras and mounting them and then turning the data over to NOAA or whoever. Yeah, so. Um, NIMFS, I guess it would be. Right, right now, the, the cameras are being um, funded through, if I'm not mistaken, a grant. It, eventually, the fishermen would have to purchase them if they, if, it, yeah. you know, in the future. Um, the cameras are installed by a authorized company. In this case, um, Archipelago Marine Research. I think they're based out of Vancouver, Canada, that are the ones doing it. So they actually come down. Morro Bay or Half Moon Bay or wherever they need to install the cameras. Um, the boats have uh, a computer kind of under the deck with a hard drive and um, it depends on the hard drive but every trip or two, maybe three trips, they can pull, they pull the hard drive out, 
put a new one in and they mail that hard drive to to a reviewing company. Yeah. In this case, um, I believe Pacific States um, Fishery... I always forget the name. Pacific States Marine Fishery Council or, or, or Commission. I, I always forget the name of it. But I believe they're the ones reviewing the footage. The goal, the goal is that once the, you know, if this is implemented here soon, which I, I think it will be for trawl vessels, um, if they can come up with a, um, a reduced review, so instead of reviewing every single minute or second of tape, which wouldn't be any savings compared to a human observer, if they can come up with some sort of an audit system where they randomly select, I don't know, five minutes or ten minutes here and five or ten minutes here and review it um, and do, do it that way, it would probably be a huge cost savings for the fishermen. So it's yet to be seen what's going to happen, but maybe next year when I come, I'll have some good news. We'll see. Okay. That would make a it, that would make a big deal. It'd be a big deal. Um, that's one of the biggest in, um, inhibitors of people participating in the fishery is literally the um, the hun the hundred percent of human observers because a three day trip is it's probably closer to sixteen hundred bucks. Um, I'm guessing. That's a lot. It's a lot of money. Um, and also for our viewing audience, could you very very briefly tell us how the community quota fund works? Yeah, the Community Quota Fund was formed in June of 2014. Uh, the Quota Fund purchased, um, part, purchased part grant from the Nature Conservancy a portfolio of quota share, um, which uh, annually equates into quota pounds, which are literally, you could think of, as of pounds of fish. Um, so combined with that, we also, um, the Quota Fund purchased permits. And so we hold these assets in Morro Bay to, with the idea of, fishing locally. Some of the species can't be fished locally. I have to lease them out of the community because they're just not caught here for, for whatever reasons. Um, but the idea is to that we lease them and we work with local fishermen. Um, it's landed here um, and it just it anchors the quota here that it, it can't it can't be um, bought or sold or transferred to northern ports. So and so if anybody has questions more about how we operate I'm, I'm happy to I'm happy to talk to them. In your opinion, how successful is the quota fund here in Morro Bay today? Well, I mean, it, it depends on what your th idea of success is. For me, the idea of success is the anchoring of the quota here. So, yeah, I think we've been very successful. Um, I think that until um, the fishery is less complicated and less expensive to participate in, we're going to struggle with finding um, fishermen to work with. We have a couple really great guys that we're working with right now um, and I'd love to engage a couple more guys to be honest with you. We have the quota, we have the permits and um, Morro Bay could always use the landings. I mean landings, landings in my mind is jobs, gas being bought, you know, ice being bought, jobs on the dock so yeah. Very good. Any other yeah. questions? Thank you Dwayne. Thanks, guys. That was very interesting and well done. Thank you. We'll see you next year. Okay, we'll go on to our business items now, and we have uh, it was uh, the election comes every February, and that was actually scheduled for C6, but with the board's concurrence, we can move it up to C1 and take care of the election right now. Bill? I'd like to nominate uh, Ron Reisner as uh, the chairman for 2018 and Lynn Mesner, the vice chairman for 2018. I'll second that. <laughs> okay. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay. That was quick. <laughs> All right. Well, one down and five to go. <laughs> okay. Now, going on, our next item is an update from the Marine Services Facility Boatyard Ad Hoc Committee. And uh, Dana, this is you, isn't it? Yes, the ad hoc committee uh, is looking forward to 
working with the uh, Harbor Department and completing a RFP draft for the City Council. And I believe Eric is going to discuss that now. <laughs> Thank you, um, Dana. So, as you know, the next logical step um, is put out an RFP for financial feasibility study services. Um, council authorized it a bit ago, including some funding, but we're going to have to bring it back to the council eventually for approval and issuance and using the ad hoc committee to help create it um, and get the Harvard Advisory Board's blessing would be the best way to go. So I've put together a draft scope and some deliverables for discussion points in what we would like to see that RFP document look like. With the information I get tonight, I will go back with the committee and start I mean, there'll be, there'll be boilerplate information in this RFP that um, probably doesn't take a lot of discussion um, in, in decision making, but really it's the, the scope and the deliverables that are the key to any RFP, and so we'll work on that and then eventually get that, hopefully, to council within the next few meetings and get that issued out and on the streets. <clears throat> so I've put together a draft scope, um, which is basically what we would like to be looked at. Um, and then deliverables, which is just what it says, what we would like to get out of the um, feasibility study. Um, as you know, we did um, contract with Lisa Wise Consulting here a couple of years ago, and they did a, um, a market analysis, a rough scale market analysis. Um, as we were um, moving kind of through the triangle lot, consideration of a, of a boatyard marine services facility, to um, try and help gauge what sort of a market we might have to just keep the project moving and inform the council and the Harbor Advisory Board. Um, that study concluded, I think, anywhere between um, $1 million and $2 million in gross revenue, depending on uh, a couple of different factors. Um, but it was a, a pretty, um, I don't want to call it simple, but it was a, um, a, a one type of look at a, a potential market of what we might have out here. So. Um, Next step, really logically, would be um, using that data, however much we can use of it, in addition to other data, and doing a real financial feasibility study. Um, the sort of three models I look at are, in terms of a, a boatyard model, would be complete private sector. In other words, ask the world to come in and build us a boatyard and operate it um, com uh, completely in the private sector. A public-private partnership, uh, meaning the city, um, comes in and, and has some skin in the game and I would, in my mind, that really means permitting and, and large-scale infrastructure and property and then bring somebody in to operate to finish it off. Um, or a complete public sector, the city does it all. We build it, um, permit it, operate it. Um, so sort of three different ways of looking at it. So <clears throat> scope-wise, um, what I at least got to have down here in draft form, um, and again, this is really for discussion input. This isn't a do-all, be-all. Um, start with using the Lisa Wise Consulting Market Analysis um, as a tool in the toolbox to help um, inform um, feasibility study conductors. Otherwise, I mean, they're going to need to know what the market is because you're generating a, uh, revenue projections and then expense projections. So um, using that as sort of a starting point for um, gauging the market or gauging the market. Um, Prepare revenue and expense projections based partially on the market analysis we got from Lisa Wise and other market analyses that they will need to do. Um, in the boatyard service model develop, developed by the HAB, which was sort of that one page concept, I forget, of 10, 11 spaces of X amount of size um, and capacity and whatnot, um, using that as our basic service model. Um, conceptual layout is um, done by RRM. Again, not necessarily the do-all, be-all, but a, you know that's a workable model that RRM um, penciled out for us when we were trying to figure out what wall was going to fit in that triangle lot. And then again, evaluate the feasibility based on um, you know development, construction, and operation of those three different concepts, pure private, public-private, and pure public. Um, and then deliverables um, being an updated um, demand analysis, market analysis, another word for demand analysis. Um, so really a robust demand analysis. Cost estimates for the project as we lay it out and as we envision it. Um, financial feasibility projections underneath those three concepts or underneath those three ideas. Um, and then a summary and any other options that um, 
feasibility study conductors come across as they as they work through the process, and then any recommended next steps. Um, so, um, again, once I get the scope and deliverables developed, I would start working with the committee and um, put together a good feasibility study. Probably work with um, Public Works as well because they do a number of these types of documents and make sure we're um, getting all the legalese and, and hitting on all the cylinders we need to hit on and then get it out in the street and see where the next steps lead us. Bill. So we put out an RFQ, we got no response. So now you're going to spend all your time and effort doing an RFP. What do you feel our success, success rate is going to be and how it will be different than getting no responses? I'm, I'm just throwing that question out. Well, the RFQ was for somebody to come in and, and throw their hat in the ring that they're interested in developing the boatyard in, again, one of the three different fashions, just purely coming in and doing it themselves or public-private or some combination thereof. So different animal in that that was asking to come in and build a boatyard. Um, being a relatively inexpensive, um, not simple, but um, relatively inexpensive step to just open up to the world to see if there is any interest out there. And if there was, um, maybe you could avoid doing a financial feasibility if you have some interested parties thinking about doing it. So that we didn't have that. I don't think necessarily says that it's financially infeasible because nobody did it and looked at it and saw it as financially feasible. I think in hindsight probably to, for somebody to really put in to that RFQ and, and be serious about it, you're going to spend a fair amount of time and money um, doing a lot of this financial feasibility study work to determine if it is going to work for you. And I just don't think anybody's willing to do that based on probably a number of factors. The, the city's progress with it so far um, and, and commitment to it so far, it's not a definite thing that, that I think somebody could say, yeah, that's going to happen, so I'm going to come build it. So I think that's where that failed. So it's, it's a different piece of the puzzle. I think, you know, we really need, I mean, we've put a lot of effort into this over the last, I don't know, three, four years now maybe. Um, well, the 20, yeah, if you go back to the beginning, uh, you know, the new, the new dynamic or the, the new game changer was acquisition of that triangle lot and a potential new location for it. So re-energized our efforts. You know, the, the feasibility study we did from Bruce Marshall back in, the, I guess it was probably the late 90s or maybe the mid-90s, it was a different location, a different model, um, very different. It didn't spell financial feasibility, but again, it was... It's not the same project it is today, or is it the same climate as it is today? We had two boatyards operating in Morro Bay back then. We had the one that's currently back at uh, Coastal Boat Works, um, and then we had the um, the one at Bob Seafood, I think, was still in operation. It was fairly limited in what it can do, but it was operating. So it's a different model back then. Um, so I think we really need to definitively figure out, you know, I, I believe this project is still potentially viable. I think... Um, under the right conditions with the right funding um, grants and other opportunities. It's a viable project. Um, but we're never going to know until we really do financial feasibility. And we've got to answer it one way or another, otherwise we're just going to muddle along and kind of go, well, what if, what if? And I think this financial feasibility is either going to, it's going to be a go, no go. And it's going to say, yeah, in this conditions it's financially feasible or it's going to say under no conditions it's just a money loser and you're going to be subsidizing it forever and then we're done it's kind of my take on it so long answer to your short question <laughs> eric do we have any budget for this rfq or rfp or any idea what what we're looking at here to spend and would it come just from the harbor department or would it be part of the general fund also we do so Back when, when I took over the directorship from Rick, um, you know, we have our, our capital projects that are the, the, uh, the projects that come out of the Harbor Accumulation Fund, the savings account, um, and the, the boatyard project from back in the 90s when it was happening 20 years ago had a budget assigned to it. And I don't know what it was originally, but when I took over, it was in the low 60,000s, uh, maybe 65,000, and it 
carried on. And when I took and Rick carried it on, even though, you know, the last what six seven years of his um, tenure, we didn't do anything on it. Just sat there. He kept that budget item alive and, and kept it as an approved item. When I took over, I did the same. Um, we spent, you know, $5,000 on RRM and some other money on Lisa Wise, and so we burned it down. But we've still got about fifty-three, fifty-four thousand, I think, in it, and I've continued to carry it over. So, yes, we do have the money designated in the approved budget um, for it. Um, exactly what this study will cost, I don't know that exactly yet. I'm still working on that, but I think we've got funding to cover it. But I would anticipate it's all going to come out of the Harbor Fund. And then my other part of the question was, um, I feel as though the general fund should chip in on some of this also. Okay, well, <laughs> you go start working on that. <laughs> no, I don't disagree. I mean, it's, it's you know, in reality, uh, if we establish a full-scale boatyard here, full-service boatyard, um, regardless of who oversees the lease or the operation of it, um, probably going to be my department, but obviously there's going to be um, financial benefit to the city general fund as a whole and, and sales tax and transient occupancy tax and you know people going to restaurants and buying stuff so there's going to be a, a multiplier in there and that will certainly help the general fund so no I don't disagree the general fund um, could potentially chip into this side we'll see what happens yeah I'd like to make a few comments on everybody's comments Bill's uh, first is big question is a good question and I'm, first of all as you look at what we're looking here for a market analysis we're looking at three different group possibilities uh, completely out of private sector development a public private partnership with this you know and then a completely city run operation um, in the RFQ that was only to private and we did get a lot of res we did get responses we just didn't get applications we didn't get middle Submittals. We got when an RFQ interest. comes out, uh, the first people who really take notice are companies involved in engineering or consulting or whatever. So they were interested. But like Eric said, it's a huge deal and, and time and, and money to be spent to put one of these together. And then um, Gene's comment about the general fund, I agree because it is it's infrastructure we are a harbor town your real estate your restaurant everything depends on what is right there and this is the infrastructure that takes care of all of the vessels in this bay and um, yeah that's all I'm gonna say for right now So probably from a process standpoint, maybe let's just try and do is um, go down the items of scope um, and just, you know, if, if you either just want to nod your heads north and south or if you've got comments um, on those different items and anything else you want to add um, from a scope standpoint, um, and Ron sent some comments as well um, in absentia, um, and his was main one was sort of on item number one, the, the Lisa Wise market analysis for reference. Um, again, and I, I, in my mind, that's a, it's a, one of the tools in the market analysis or demand analysis toolbox. It's not the do-all, be-all. I certainly wouldn't intend to put out the RFP for these services and say, here's your market, use this for your revenue data, and leave it at that. Um, I would want them to look um, broader and wider um, and deeper. Um, and develop a market analysis more thoroughly. Ron's suggestion, I think it was a good one to kind of look at four sectors. Sector one, number one being Morro Bay and local environs, Port San Luis-ish area, you know, our central coast zone here. Um, U.S. coastal markets south of um, Port San Luis, now there's probably Southern California. Um, Bay Area um, being the third one. And then the transient folks. Um, so kind of four discrete areas you can look at and focus on. Um, I think our LWC study looked pretty much all, in fact, I think it was tasked with what's the local market 
Um, and then it concluded you're going to get approximately, what was it, 10% more or something of transient boats on top of what your local would be, and, which was a sound assumption, but it was very limited in scope. And so um, I think Ron's idea of, of having whoever does this look at four sort of discrete sectors and report out on them discreetly so that we can make some informed decisions about those zones combine them together obviously in, a, in one package once it's all done for a final number but be able to look at them individually so that you can uh, maybe make some de decisions on market analysis targeting and um, and whatnot and but again use sort of the LWC study for a starting point and for data locally and then spread it out further so um, maybe we'll take these one at a time and take your input on them and then we'll just move down the list I think what you've done here is, is, is commendable. I don't have any other comments. I would just like to, uh, yeah, I was, you gave a description of what Ron added to this, and it was basically from where our potential customers come from, and uh, I, I agree from local and transients and, and uh, from north and south, uh, those I think would be more like transients. Um, but also we have to think I think we're just thinking boatyard and where these boats are going to be hauled out. But when it comes to boat storage, you could be talking about people from the valley that want to leave their boat here so they don't have to drag it back and forth, whether they're going fishing or sailing or whatever. And so that's, that's uh, uh, an addition into the uh, scope of, of work here. Um, yeah, it's a good point, the, the storage element. As we know, that's, that's probably the first thing to get built and actually taking that to council. Uh, next week, or not next week, week after next, the 13th, the, the Harbor Advisor Board's recommendation to move forward on some storage back there. So as we know, that's pretty instant cash to start making money on that at a relatively low cost. So that's important. So thank you for that. Yeah, otherwise I think it's, uh, I think what you have here is pretty good, pretty good place to start with, and I look forward to working with staff on, on producing this. Uh, is there any public comment on the marine facilities uh, report? Seeing none, public comment closed. And if that's it, we'll go on to the next item on our agenda, which is the update from Finance and Budget Ad Hoc Committee. Bill. Considering that uh, the other two members are absent, um, i.e., Ron Reisner, and I believe um, it's in congratulations. Neil Maloney just had his first child tonight. Is that correct, Eric? Well, the text I got, um, she was in labor. Okay. But everything, knock on wood. So good, Neil, so. Neil had to, uh, of course, bail from us. <laughs> He's a little <laughs> oyster. <laughs> but. Um, uh, attached here, we have um, Eric and myself and Ron and Neil have been working over the last uh, year or so just to kind of take a look at um, capital requirements, capital expenditures that the harbor needs to make, and um, making sure that the city council, the city, the public understands the dynamics, um, that we have a lot of infrastructure costs that we're not going to be able to fund given our, our budget, and we just want to make sure that everyone's aware of it so that um, it's not a surprise when a, a crisis occurs. So here in front of you, you, we have one sheet that we put together. We want you folks to look at it here at the Harbor Advisory Board and make sure that you understand it. And what we did do from last month was we put in a priority sheet, you know, which in case, you know, of course we don't have all the money, what is the number one priority? So Eric put that together. I have some notes from Ron that, that we've made in our joint meetings that I could read 
after you guys have had a chance to discuss this. But first, probably Eric, maybe you can go over the spreadsheet and explain that a little bit to us so that we, if we have any questions. Yeah, thanks, Bill. So the first page and a half basically is the original spreadsheet. I just wanted to leave that and, and not totally erase it. Um, and then the, the, the ask was for, can we sort these pri by priority? We had prioritized. Prioritizing was something we did um, as part of a um, work effort that we did over the last four or five months, which we did. We put a priority category in there, a priority column in there. Um, but then the next ask was, well, can we sort it now by priority? So the, as Bill says, you can see the priority one, two, three things. And so I did that. Um, and then the other asks were to go out to 10 years because we really, a 10 year budget forecast is more useful than five. Five is pretty close. Um, this doesn't go out to 10 years. It, the numbers in the columns going out on each successive year reflect if you were to replace or do the thing by the date that we say it should be done by and amortize it over that time, the cost, that's what would be in each column. And it, obviously some of them go beyond 2021, but I don't have it going out that far yet, but I will. But um, I, really the main thing was redoing the prioritization on there um, and then adding revetment seawalls and bulkheads, um, sort of the big um, ticket items that we're going to own or that we do own that aren't part of our leaseholders to deal with. There's fortunately not too many of those, um, but, and I haven't added those on there. But the thing I really wanted to get in front of the HAB tonight was this prioritization section from um, on the second page, middle, um, bottom, down to the third page, just to make sure it's useful. Um, and any suggestions on that? Because it was a fair amount of work to put it together and rearrange it that way. And I didn't want to do the next two pages of these because there's two more of these spreadsheets. Uh, they're longer and more complicated. So I did the first simple one first. So I just want to kind of get input on that and make sure it's useful and anything else we might want to see on it. So if you go sorted by priority, basically what you get is you, you get what the thing is over on the left, um, placed in service the year, approximately the years in life it in theory has, um, what its priority is, um, the box in the middle that says approved, um, the column that's outlined in dark, that's in this year's approved budget. Um, there should be some things in there, something might have disappeared on that. Um, but then you go out to the fiscal year requirements um, and it shows what, as I spoke earlier, if you were to, to, to replace it over the period of life that we say it has left at the cost we believe it is, it amortizes it over, that's how it comes out. So when you go down each column, the, the bolded numbers are totalizers. So if you go to the first one, the two uh, priority ones, patrol boat 6-8 and the sand spit emergency phone, you know, and, and this fiscal year, 1718, um, in theory, you put away $100,000 for it, and you put away 7,500 for the Sandspit phone. You add those up, and we should have put 1075 away. That's what that totalizer is. And then, if you run to the right on those totalized bottoms of the column, you get 315,000. That is um, a totalizer for those priorities. So I tried to build in some formulas to make it useful, so you wouldn't have to pull out your own pencil and paper. So if, if that looks useful, I'll continue on with that format. Board here? Does the committee like it this way? Yeah. We do. That's good for me. It's easy to read this way. Yeah. Now, the only one question is um, what would be good for everyone that looks at this what is the accumulated funds? How much do we really have? Which has always been a nebulous figure. Moving target. We're looking at this. I mean, this is all nice. I mean, we're going to need $107,000. How much money do we really have? So if we prioritize this and say, well, this is really all we have for this fiscal year to spend to allocate it. I mean, that's one, one figure that ne we never really see. And, I, and that... I'm just really... I, no, and I'm, I'm going to take that as a, a request that we put that on there. I mean, yeah. I think right now it's, it's, as you know, it's in flux. I've, I've not gotten 
back from or back with the new finance director. I mean, she's been busy with a heck of a lot of other things. Um, but my my harbor accumulation fund changed under the last finance director, and we never sorted it out. And I've yet to get with Jennifer completely yet and figure it out just because we haven't done it. But um, kind of like we did with our um, council goal budgeting, we had the list of the goals and their approximate costs. Um, and then they were prioritized like this, and then the available funds were laid against it. And at some point on the spreadsheet, you had a line where you couldn't go any further. And so then the decision was, well, do we move this one off above the line and put it below and, and switch them around? So I think same exercise here would be the aim, um, be able to put a accumulation fund number down there, well, how much money we have, and put it against this, and then start horse trading. So I will endeavor to do that. Eric, is it possible to take priority number one and put a list of that, priority number two, put a list of that, as opposed to vehicle, a list of vessels, equipment, just do number one, two, three, four, down the line that way? Do you understand? Well, he does have it on the second page. Yeah. There's priority one, two, three, four. Oh, uh, I see. Yeah, I, I kept it. You're right. I apologize. Yeah. Yeah. So. I mean, there are there's sort of subcategories. There's, and I, I kept them in their their larger categories. Vehicle, vessel, and equipment replacement is one category that I prioritize one through five, and then vehicle, vessel, equipment, major maintenance and repair. Um, so, are you asking to meld those together? So no, the, all I, the priority I misread ones? it. I, I, I think okay. he knows now. Okay. Yeah. All right. The other thing that I do have, I, I don't know if I'll read this. I have uh, some notes here that I would like to give to you after the meeting. Uh, is that appropriate? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I have a couple things that okay. we can we can add here. Okay. I, I don't think it's going to. I'd like to add um, um, the launch ramp itself to the schedule. And um, he already said recommended adding revivement sites that yeah. are the responsibility of the city. So, yeah. and we should add the floating dock replacement costs too that we're doing right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I have a couple of lists here. No, that's good. And I think, you know, the hardest part, like most spreadsheets, is just setting them up and getting the formulas in. I mean, ideally, I'd like to have it to where you plug the cost number in and. It, it's able to totalize out per year instead of me hand entering everything in. I mean, you can do that. It just it just takes time. But once it's set up, then it'll be self filling. Thank you, Eric. Lynn, Mike. I shouldn't turn it off. I have a very minor question about these. Uh, priority Tidelands vessel vessel sewage pump out and it says rebuild pump at five year mark grant funding secured so that means what it says the grant funding has already been secured since that yes should be due last year <laughs> or the year before if it's five years yes we've got the grant funding for that okay I just I'd have to look at that at 2011. That, that might be right, but that sounds like that might not be right. But yeah, we, we actually got the grant funding. It's NEP um, grant funding, and they basically bought a rebuild kit for it for us and some oh. parts. So so that's in hand. We might. Okay, thank you. Uh, anything else on this topic? Anything from our audience? Okay, the next thing we have on C3 is an update from the Eelgrass Ad Hoc Committee. And this time I'll put it in the right order. Do we have, we'll open public comment on Eelgrass. There's anybody who wants to talk about this? Public comment is closed. And I have, I am the chair of the Eelgrass Committee and actually the committee has not met in the last month. Uh, but, of course, we will hear from Eric about the Anchor QEA uh, contract with, with uh, Anchor. 
you know, probably let's, let's get in touch next week. Um, let's talk next week and get all the committee, just get back in touch with all the committee members and let them know that we're going to ramp up and, and get we'll figure out a schedule how we want to meet with Anchor, whether it's probably just a, maybe a um, telephone call to start with, conference call okay. with them and we'll just figure out how we want to move forward on that. Okay. Eric, you're looking at their proposal. Do you feel as though it's enough? Yeah, I well, like, it's, I almost it's, feel like they're just going to give back what we already have. No, that was the that was our biggest fear when we had the first proposal. Was um, you know it, the, the item number one was research the existing research kind of, and we said, well, we know the existing research, especially if we talk to the NEP and we've got them on the committee. No sense re researching the research, so we pulled that off. No, I feel um, they revised the scope and the deliverables. Um, yeah, we're limited by budget. It's a fairly tight budget. It's basically to help us point us in the right direction and and um, guide us in what's useful from the other two plans that have been done in Newport Beach and Humboldt Bay. And um, if it, in, in my mind, if it if it points in a, a in a, in a plausible direction in which we can go to achieve some sort of regulatory control relief. Um, what have you, I think, then it goes into the bigger budgeting process to really budget for for an overall um, large-scale effort because it's going to take a long-term effort to put together mitigation policy, including a lot of funding. And then there's probably grant funding out there. I think Humboldt Bay got some grant funding for theirs. So that's the next battle. Any other questions? No. Okay, that's... That one will go on now to an update from the Marine Sanctuary Ad Hoc Committee. Well, uh, that's yeah, that is Ron. Ron. And um, Ron sent me an email this Before morning. Before you go on, oh. we asked for public comment <laughs> on this topic. Seeing none, public comment is closed. Bill. I got an um, email from Ron uh, Reisner this morning. He um, reached out to uh, Bill Doros, who is the regional director of NOAA. And he got a response back um, yesterday. Mr. Reisner, my response today is the same as my response on May 19, 2017. There are no NOAA activities currently underway with regard to the nomination for the Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary and no plans at this time to initiate its designation. The Office of National Marine Sanctuaries is focused on the designation activities for two other proposed sanctuaries in the inventory, Lake Michigan in Wisconsin and Mallows Bay in Maryland. Regards, Bill Doris. So that's the update on our sanctuary. There is no update and I don't think you're going to see an update. We'll move on to item C7, a review and recommendations on proposed changes to the definitions in the Morro Bay Municipal Code, uh, Chapter 15, and Harbor Department rules and regulations regarding environmental best management practices. Uh, this is the topic. Do we have anybody in the audience who would like to speak to this? Public comment is closed. And Let's see. Gene. You forgot C5. <laughs> Working forgot. waterfront. I did. <laughs> Could we take that after we do sure. this one? Since <laughs> we've already started here. What happened? So, Mr. Andersby, you're up. Okay, so C7, so this is the rules and regulations relating the municipal code relating to environmental best practices type things. Um, as you recall, we ran this through the HAB 
um, some time ago and took input and now I'm bringing it back and get some final um, input which will eventually go into the final product and we'll get to the council at some point. Um, so this is this like again the environmental areas um, of our rules and regulations and municipal code. Most of it lives um, in the boating best management practices document in terms of what we're looking at tonight but the, the um, other two items are some modifications to our rules and regulations. One was sort of a um, um, policy statement in terms of um, environmental best management practices and that's item number one um, and this was brought before the HAB as well and um, this is a result of the input we got from the HAB. Um, the statement being the city of Morro Bay is committed to preserving and enhancing the Morro Bay Harbor environment through proper management activities, management of activities that occur in the harbor. In accordance with state, federal, and industry guidelines, the city has established a best management practices BMP document boaters and harbor users are expected to abide by. Uh, and then attachment number one to the staff report is that BMP policy document. Um, broke it down into a number of like um, areas in terms of categories, seven categories. Um, if we'd like to go through them uh, one by one, again, this was from input um, from the public, from the HAB, from staff, um, all boiled together, all put in the sausage maker, and this is the um, from all my notes and from all the input we had, um, what came out um, in terms of language that we would put into a document. Um, Ron had a suggestion that this, all of our boaters, whether the transient or permanent slip holders, be expected to sign this, sign off on this. Um, I would agree with that. Um, that they should all get this document. It's available in our harbor office, um, posted on our website and other places. So, um, the BMP document itself, um, section number one, bilge water management. Um, Lynn, do you want to go through these? No. One by one. <laughs> I don't know that we do. I mean, has everybody looked at them? Anybody need to make any comments on any of them? Yeah, it, couldn't we just all look at it? Hopefully we have looked at it beforehand and we've done it before. And One would if there's any comments or any corrections, let's do it now. I mean, that's my opinion. That's fine if the other members of the board are agree. Yeah, that's fine with me. Like I said, I tried to faithfully recreate everything from input we had um, from the materials that I brought. And I know Ron had done an extensive amount of research and had a fair amount of printed materials that he brought forward and some of that stuff we just said use that and use that and that's what we took. Mm -hmm. Do we want to include Ron's comments? In a recommendation? Well, he did already put them in before so I don't know if there's anything there. I have a couple of uh, comments on the boating management practices. One is a redundancy. 3E is listed there as well as on 5B. Those are identical. Uh, I don't know if that was on purpose or if you was not on purpose. If you think it's necessary, you could eliminate it from 3E and just leave it in 5B. Okay. So noted. Uh, another one spent sacrificial. Uh, let's see. This is six H spent sacrificial anode shall be properly recycled. Uh, I have never heard or seen any place to deposit spent anodes and so I'm wondering where one does that we take them um, we have a scrapper that takes them and if you brought them to the household hazardous waste facility at the wastewater treatment plant on Saturdays from they take them and pile them in with everything three. else they take them and eventually they go to a recycler they do go to a recycler yeah well, they're metal. They're they're a commodity. Yeah, they are. They're, they're zinc. <laughs> yeah, they're zinc. So they either place will take them. But it is not something. Well, it's not in my experience. I have not seen any place like in a boatyard when I've been hauled out 
uh, I've just not seen that as a priority. Jeremiah? Um, yeah, many boat yards do take them and they pour, use them for uh, pouring uh, uh, sha uh, uh, wheel bearing on the end of the shaft, on the end of the wheel. So harbors will take them, melt them down, and really? actually pour that hub bearing, uh, that hub uh, zinc. And also many uh, of our, a few, I should say, of our uh, crab fishermen will take them and they'll pour small zincs for their traps. All of those traps have an a anode also. Did they have the a collection French site brother, where the they... French, there's no site, but I know the French brothers, if somebody's looking for a place, French brothers will take them. So if you've used one and it's all, you know, pitted and is it still, I mean, if when it's used, when it's spent, so to speak, is it disappeared, gone? No, it's half gone. Well, normally, most people change them when they're half gone. That, that's but, correct. So there's usable a, metal in them when they're still... So there's still a good bit of metal. Okay. I mean, if you put a three-pounder on your, on your rudder, if you have a steel rudder like I do, um, yeah, when it gets down, uh, there's still a good bit of metal left. You just got to melt it down? And it just has to be melted yeah. down, okay. but almost always I, I have seen people put them in the trash. Yeah, very recyclable, but and they're very expensive now that... Price they, is getting prices more getting, expensive every day. And I'm sure the EPA is well, when, so, I was, yeah. when I was building my boat, um, there was these two Greek brothers owned the boat yard where I was, and they collected all of them. Really? And they smelted them. They had a big pot belly in the in uh, part of their boat yard. And on rainy days, they would smelt all of them, and they had little molds, fill them back up, and resell them. Well, good. I like that. So, Lynn, probably I'm, I'm going to put words in your mouth and say that we should add to the bottom of this document where people can recycle all these things. Yes. Oil, I, filters. Yes. All that stuff. There should be a well, list it is, and phone it numbers. It is mentioned on some of the things. Yeah. Uh, okay. But anything that's not there, yes, I think it should be in there. Lynn? Yes, sir. Or Eric? Go. Um, is there any provision for sandblasting? I don't, do we need to call out how we handle sandblasting? We do under repair and maintenance. Yeah, 6C, use vacuum bag, sanders. D and E, containment by tanning, tarping, securing overboard skippers, scuppers to contain all maintenance debris. Ron had a suggestion of um, 6E add language um, at the end of the uh, required to contain all maintenance debris and products, comma, to include debris and products produced by sanding, scraping, chipping, so kind of defining a little more, which probably isn't a bad ad. Uh, but yeah, we've got provision in there for that. Anything else from anybody? So we have one thing that you wanted to amend. Is that what I heard, or is there more than that? You, you were talking about the uh, adding on the recycling of the... We'll add on recycling opportunities. We'll get rid of the repeat, um, non-toxic biodegradable. Um, make sure they sign it. It's got a signature box of some sort. Um, Ron suggesting to include debris and products produced by sanding, scraping, and chipping to 6E. Uh, he had another suggestion of um, BMP2A. Um, first, the question was, what is the definition of a, a small outboard? And he suggested changing it to say, a, a, basically a small outboard is an outboard motor with a portable fuel tank. Because once you get to the point of not having a portable tank, you're probably not a portable motor in a small uh, outboard anymore. Except if you have a small outboard engine, you take the cap, and it, it could have an internal cap, and you take the cap off, and you're pouring 
well, fuel uh, into it right over the water. That's, so it could be either one, that's portable fuel tank or a, integral fuel tank. A tank that you have inside your boat is already in secondary containment. It's inside the boat. Right. But a small outboard motor would be one with a portable fuel tank or an integral fuel tank. Or an integral fuel tank. Okay, I just... That makes sense? Okay. Yeah. All right. Anything else on that document? So that's the BMPs. Back to a couple of the rules and regulations, if I can find it. Did I lose it? So the other two items, uh, modification of, and this is on the first page of the staff report, um, under discussion, item number three, modification of Morro Bay Municipal Code 1524020 to better describe petroleum discharge prohibition. Um, and I did it in, in strike out underline format. So things struck out are obviously going away and underline is new um, and changing. It's probably a pretty old definition um, that need to be updated, so um, strike out and add in format um, as indicated in Ron's suggestion was um, don't remove or in that first sentence. So in other words, petroleum product discharge prohibited. No person shall pump or discharge from any vessel or tank. He thought the, the meaning changed if I remove that or, so his suggestion was to keep or, which seems like a good one. Maybe splitting hairs, but that's okay. Hmm. We don't mind splitting hairs. <clears throat> so I added oily bilge water, fuel, grease. You know, the old one said oil and spirits and flammable liquid, which is, sounds like kind of old school language, which is fine, but we need the new school the stuff. The spirit too. stays in there. Is, are spirits really that bad for the water? <laughs> they are miscible. Depends <laughs> on. Huh? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I assume that's mineral spirits or some other kind of spirits. Only on, only on happy hour. <laughs> I can understand oil, fuel, grease, but spirits? <laughs> right. It's still ethanol. I mean, the catch-all, the, the, the definition, the, the first sentence of, of what this item is about, petroleum product discharge, that covers everything. Right, but not spirits. <laughs> they are not petroleum. Mineral spirits are petroleum. I think that's what this spirits meant. Okay. I mean, I can, yeah. I, I, all right. We may not like spirits. <laughs> Anything else on that one? Okay, and then the second one, item number four, uh, modification of Municipal Code 1524 to account for prohibition of treated sewage discharge. Um, although the original said all discharges are prohibited, um, I think there's a, a misunderstanding that treated discharges were okay. Um, I know I've had conversations with the Regional Water Board about that, and that's really a wastewater treatment plant that needs to be permitted, and um, I don't know any that are. Um, on both, so um, it really makes more sense that if we're really trying to prohibit discharges of human waste, that's treated or untreated. Um, so I added that, um, including black water, into that. And that was a recommendation from the Harbor Advisory Board as well. Dana, you had something? Would move to approve all of these best management practices with the uh, changes that we just spoke about. I'll second that. Discussion? Any other comments on these things? So we'll take a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 
So now we can go backwards and go to uh, item C5, which is an update from the Working Waterfront, and my apologies, Jane. <laughs> Uh, could we first have public comment on this item? No public comment. Uh, public comment is closed. Okay. Um, we have not heard back from staff. They were going to get back to us from our last meeting from the planning commissioners and the staff to um, have them um, revise our statements and get back to us so we could approve it and move it on to um, approval. Um, and the only comment I would have is when we were looking at um, the working waterfront and especially Measure D is one of the, the definitions we were looking at was um, primary use and the definition that we were coming up with was highest and best use. Um, I would kind of like to add we should also include historical uses of an area. I think that's important and we'll all get that back into when we have our, our meetings. And then also I think somehow in the working waterfront, we need to, to be aware or, or create some kind of possibility for some wind energy staging possibilities. We haven't really addressed this, and if it comes, it will come, and we need to address it at some point. So I think we'll bring that up in our next meeting. That's only my comments. So we did, and I don't know if we reported this at the last meeting. I don't think so. Um, so we met again, our, our dual subcommittee with two members from Planning Commission, although the last meeting well, one of them wasn't able to make it, and then two members from the Harvard Advisory Board met back on January 20-something, maybe? I don't, no, not 20-something. It was early, earlier in January. Anyhow, we met, um, made some good progress. That's right. So I did report on this already. Yeah, okay. So we're staff is due to, to produce some materials back to the joint committee um, then we'll mull it over and then ultimately get it to a, a full committee or a full meeting of the Harbor Advisory Board and Planning Commission um, all 27 of us in the same room at the same time um, and then present the joint subcommittee's findings and recommendations to the joint PC HAB and hopefully something will come out of the joint PC HAB and they'll recommend to the General Plan Advisory Committee and then our work will be done and eventually it works its way to the City Council and hopefully it comes done. That takes care of all of our our business items so we're up to declaration of future agenda items is there anything anybody wants to add to our agenda other than this long list that we already have <laughs> I think we have a pretty full list I'd like uh, to see some of these things come up they will eventually I'm sure in that case I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Good job.